Hello and welcome to Procontation Points Video Snark. I read bad books so that you don't have to. I'm continuing my read through of Breach by K.I. Lin. Not the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. Please be warned that this review contains adult material. I try my best to use metaphors and be vague, but sometimes you have to talk about a rooster. Chapter 15 and... <sighs> Even just glancing at this chapter can feel a headache coming on. I think that this is the almost obligatory flashback into the male lead's tragic past told from his first-person perspective. I've said this before and I'm going to keep saying it. No amount of trauma gives any single person the right to be that much of a jerk towards other people. However, much to my surprise, it is actually Delilah's tragic past. It's nothing but her father smacking her around and saying that nobody would ever love her. It's about her stepbrother telling her that she should get, just get out. It's about her stepmother laughing about selling her off to the highest bidder. And... I have to say, none of this seems remotely believable. It's like the author was picking some of the worst tropes that were themselves already greatly exaggerated. If I thought that the author could pull this off, I would say that it would turn out that Delilah's relationship with their father, stepmother, and stepbrother aren't half as strained as she's making it out to be. But because this book has already gone above and beyond to prove that the author has no idea how regular relationships with other human beings function, this nightmare is nothing more than just yet another exhibit of how much that the author doesn't know how to write. Also, I know that I keep saying that Nathan doesn't have the right to treat people like that. The same goes for Delilah. I'm specifically thinking about the scene in the previous chapter where she tied Nathan up and demanded that he become emotionally vulnerable with her. No amount of psychological abuse would ever excuse behavior like that. Nathan naturally wakes her up. As she comes to, she realizes that she has to throw up and barely makes it to the toilet in time. She feels Nathan's gaze on her. She cleans herself up and has to keep reminding herself that it's Nathan and not the members of her family. Nathan is obviously concerned about her but decides that the best thing to do right then is to box her into the bathroom. Delilah is still in that panicked flight or flight mode from her dream and backs into the corner. But then she goes to him and kisses him. And... Yes, she did brush her teeth, but you know her breath still probably stings like vomit. He cleans her up again before he starts trying to ground her. And I give him credit for trying, but take off a million points for this. You are my rooster slut, my fun times goddess, my beautiful girl. That's all you need to know. Look, I'm all for a dirty talk, but do you want to know when a really bad time to call somebody any one of these is? Right after they have a violent nightmare and bad reaction towards memories of their psychological and physical abuse at the hands of their family. Furthermore, a way to reduce Delilah's sole benefit to the entire world is being there to warm Nathan's rooster. She contributes completely and utterly nothing to the entire universe except to pleasure Nathan in bed. He gets her off right then and there, and the chapter mercifully ends on that bizarre note. Chapter 16. It was a long emotional weekend with Nathan. I'm sorry, but whose fault is it that it was an emotional weekend? I'm not talking about the nightmare. I'm talking about how angry I still am that literally anybody would go as far as Delilah did to emotionally manipulate Nathan. He had the ability to heal me or destroy me, and I didn't know which way it would go. I'm still waiting for somebody's feelings to get hurt, although at this point you know that it would be 100% Delilah. Anyway, all of that in the past several chapters happened over a single weekend. Delilah is practically relieved to get back to work, even if she can't stop thinking about Nathan. However, Delilah is less than thrilled to leave for work and find Andrew waiting for her by her car. And again, his behavior is sending up so many red flags, but we'll push that aside for now. Andrew says that he now understands that he was jealous when Delilah came out covered in baby batter the other night at the bar. Which, yes, a good first step. Do you want to know what a good second step would be? To give the lady who has made it quite clear that she wants something to do with you, space. My behavior was horrible. I guess I was in shock and, to be honest, a little turned on by the thought of fun times with you in a public place. I mean, if you wanted fun times, why didn't you come to me? We were always very good in that department. It wasn't just that, though. It's like this guy just legit does not grasp the idea that he and Delilah broke up a few months ago. So, so many red flags. However, he continues on and says that Delilah seems different somehow. Lighter. I am never going to be what you need. I am never going to heal you. He understands you, doesn't he? Not just this book, but it sure is prominent here, but like half of romance novels in general seem to think that the number one way to cure what ails you is a romantic partner. And I'm not swinging hard on the entire you need to learn how to love yourself before you can love another person toxic BS. 
what I'm saying is that what do people think is going to happen once they get a boyfriend? That their mental problems will just magically go away? No. Now you're mentally ill, but you have a boyfriend. And I'm going to keep saying this over and over until people understand. Your romantic partner is not your therapist. And the fact that Delilah first said that Nathan would heal her, and now Drew is saying that Delilah's boyfriend is clearly healing her, it's baffling. Y'all honestly think that Delilah is going to be okay if and when she and Nathan inevitably break up. However, despite Drew talking about Delilah's own mental shortcomings, he turns to Delilah for reassurance that he helped her in some way too. I cannot with this right now. I just can't. Thankfully, Nathan shows up and tells Drew to get lost, that all three of them have to be into work soon. However, Nathan leaves immediately after this. Drew tells Delilah that he doesn't like Nathan and says that Nathan has a reputation of being a womanizer. However, Delilah is quick to point out that he isn't like that, especially because she'd know. But from where I'm sitting, even if she wasn't in a romantic relationship with Nathan, his reputation is more of he's hot and women pester him while he tries to maintain a strictly professional relationship with each of them. I still feel sorry for Nathan, but again, not too much. He, he refuses to do anything about it, including telling his boss. But Drew also mentions that there's a reason why Nathan isn't in the courtroom anymore, which I'd be more likely to believe over his womanizer behavior. Delilah is so angry over that, but decides to let it go. She reminds Drew that they have work, and so they get into their cars and leave. In the parking lot of the office, she finds Nathan. They walk together in silence and get onto the elevator together. Once the door is shut, Nathan kisses her and again states about how jealous he is over Drew. And I'm honestly done with Nathan's jealousy. I said what I said in a previous videos. At this point, is basically just beating a dead horse. And, oh god. They're doing it. In the public elevator at the place where they work, the same place that has the book's almost Tyler clause about fraternization. Nathan gives her a hickey before he takes off her scarf and refuses to return it. Says that he wants everybody to know that she's owned. Which, am I the only one who remembers that this book is supposed to be about two co-workers scooting around the anti-fraternization clause? Chapter 17. They both go to their office. Delilah finds it hard to focus on her work because Nathan took her underwear following the counter. She's worried that it'll somehow give her away. Like, hold on a second. Does she seriously think that not wearing any underwear is just going to be announced to the entire office? I have multiple questions and I want zero answers. Anyway, because it's been a while since this book last reminded us of how sexist it is, the boob squad shows up, and there are a few things that I'd like to highlight. I went about my work, and of course, before 10 hit, the boob squad was making their appearance. Two days without seeing him appeared to be torturous. It would be for me. Then again, he was with me and not them. He called me his, and he was very adamant about that fact, but in terms of a relationship... I wasn't sure. Our constant limbo had me on edge. The only thing that calmed me was his touch. He anchored me then, cemented me to him. I was happy Kelly didn't say too long. She was becoming almost scary in her soccer tendencies as she backwards stepped out of the office so she was able to continue staring at him for as long as possible. First, she makes fun of the boob squad for being unable to be away from Nathan for two days. And in the same breath, she herself admits that she wouldn't be able to do it. And then she goes on to explain about how fragile that her own emotional state is in regards to Nathan, right before she calls Kelly's behavior stalker-like. Completely and utterly zero self-awareness. Do you think that the author even realizes how terrible and hypocritical that Delilah came off in this passage? After Kelly leaves, Delilah goes to the bathroom and takes a picture of her bear behind, which she obviously sends to Nathan. He responds with a picture of his rooster, which is described as being hard and weeping. However, this has the opposite effect on Delilah, who only just wanted to tease Nathan. Now she's more worked up than ever. He sends her a text that forbids her from touching herself, which, yeah, no <laughs> Sherlock, it's the middle of the workday and you're at the office. They get back to work, but Andrew shows up just before lunch. He gets kind of upset at the sight of the hickey on Delilah's neck, but what did he expect, honestly? Finally, the workday is over and Delilah and Nathan end up in the elevator alone. And, oh god, Nathan decides that he's going to take a page out from Christian Gray's book and tells her that she'd be a great sub. I can't. I'm not going to do this if this turns into what the author thinks is BDSM, but it's actually just non-consensual slapping and other forms of abuse. 
I'm all for well-written, well-researched BDSM, but um, I hope I don't have to tell you why it is that I'm apprehensive about stuff that was formerly Twilight fanfic trying to give us more of it. And after the intense psychological abuse that Delilah inflicted upon Nathan earlier, I honestly don't want to see any of these psychos buying whips or a pair of handcuffs. But they go back to the apartment building and barely make it inside before they're on each other. However, once inside, Nathan demands that she say over and over that she's his. Except, despite the fact that this was exactly what Delilah wanted, now that she has it, it seems as though her emotional issues are demanding that she emotionally push him away. I can't with her. I can feel like you looking at me like a piece of meat, if that's what you're talking about. Forget it. I thought you were going to make today more of my while, not place to begins with me. I'm sick of this. I mean, good for her for calling him out on behavior that she doesn't like, but at the same time, I'm just so frustrated with both of their constant back and forth behavior. She then starts to leave, but now it's Nathan who is calling her out this time. He randomly says that she only gets aroused because of him, not because of Drew. But she's frustrated with his behavior and continues calling him out for continuing to play games with her, even after she asks him to stop. He then leaves, which only just infuriates Delilah, despite the fact that she was about to leave not even a page earlier. And then, because this is what everybody in a relationship should do, she suggests that she should just call Drew because at least he doesn't play games. Says the girl who is playing off of Nathan's jealousy. Seriously? What the- but it does have the desired effect, and he comes back in growling about how she's his and not Drew's anymore. They start to go at it, but stops before she finishes with the idea that she proclaim who she belongs to before he will allow it. And again, I'm all for the big finish denial, but following whatever psychotic, manipulative, toxic BS that was this chapter, I am not here for this. He then lets her finish, and she falls asleep in his arms. Thanks for listening to my book, Snark on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to support me. The first is watching this video as well as all of my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book, Snarks. Always free and updated every morning. And if you've already read all of my main snarks, then you can find even more snark on my Patreon. You can access it for $1 a month. Plus, you also get early access to my main Tumblr snark. Special thanks to Don, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $3 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well. $3 for every 5,000 words. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of erotic short stories and now two full-length novels. I also sometimes run flash sales on my stories, and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering more things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys.